Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so pleased to be joined today by my great partner, Attorney General Eric Holder, and members of our department's senior leadership team to provide an update on the efforts to stamp out waste and fraud in our healthcare system to protect consumers and safeguard taxpayer dollars. As the Affordable Care Act has been implemented over the last three few weeks, uh, the country has been getting some long overdue good news about health care. We've got small businesses notified that they'll be receiving tax credits starting this year to help them provide health coverage to their employees. Young adults have learned that they can stay on their parents' health insurance plans until they turn 26. And seniors who have fallen into the so-called prescription drug donut hole are looking forward to their rebate checks next month that will help them afford their medications. So slowly but surely, Americans are getting more control over their health care. A more consumer-friendly market for health insurance is taking place. But unfortunately, just as the future of our health care system begins to look brighter, we're hearing reports of criminals trying to exploit these changes. In states like Delaware and Wyoming, reports have come in that scam artists are already calling seniors and telling them they need to share their Medicare ID numbers in order to get the new benefits. In other states, we've had reports that seniors have been asked for personal information in order to get their new Medicare ID cards. Let me make it clear, there are no new Medicare ID cards. Uh, these old crimes are now having a new spin. Every year, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance companies pay out billions of dollars in fraud fraudulent claims. To cover these claims, we all pay what amounts to a health care fraud tax in the form of higher premiums. Now, some of the criminals are seeing the new health insurance reform rules as an opportunity to launch new schemes. And my message to them today is this. There's never been a worse time to try and steal Americans' health care dollars. What these criminals may not know is that the Affordable Care Act is not just about making our health insurance system work better for families. It also contains some of the strongest anti-fraud health care provisions in American history. So under this new law, we're going to attack fraud at every single stage of the process. We're going to more thoroughly check health care providers who want to participate in Medicare or Medicaid. The days when you could just hang out a shingle and start submitting claims are over. Next, we're going to make it easier for law enforcement to see health care claims data from different government agencies in one place at one time. Uh, under the old system, we had a, a data system as if police officers from towns one apart weren't able to talk to each other. So we want to give law enforcement agents access to the big picture, helping them to identify suspicious patterns and claims data that can indicate fraud at the outset. Third, the penalties are increased for fraud. When you commit Medicare or Medicaid fraud, you're stealing from every U.S. taxpayer and the criminals will be punished accordingly. Fourth, we're going to provide new resources to get more boots on the ground to fight fraud in communities across the country. Altogether, there's a proposed $600 million over the next 10 years. And when experts study the anti-fraud programs, they find they actually pay for themselves in money returned to taxpayers, often many times over. That means going after fraud is one of the best investments we can make. These are just a few of the anti-fraud provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Added together, here's what the changes look like in terms of the perspective of potential criminal. It'll be harder to submit false claims. You're more likely to get caught if you do. And when you get caught, you're going to face stiffer penalties. That's a big deterrent, and it's why we believe the Affordable Care Act will not only allow us to identify and prosecute more episodes of health care fraud, but we believe it'll help us prevent fraud from happening in the first place. What's going to make these new steps even more effective is that they're built on a strong foundation. Over the last 15 months, President Obama has led the fight against fraud and the fight to strengthen program integrity across government. 
This January, for example, Attorney General Holder and I hosted the first ever National Health Care Fraud Summit and for the first time brought together government, law enforcement, and private insurance officials to share best strategies for fighting fraud. Out of that conversation, we developed a list of next steps that we're already following up on. The Fraud Summit was made possible partly because of the great progress that had already been made in 2009 with the creation of the Joint HHS-DOJ Heat Task Force. Again, the first time ever that a cabinet-level partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice led to a vastly improved coordination of our anti-fraud efforts across government and the addition of new Medicare fraud strike force teams in healthcare fraud hubs like Detroit and Houston. To learn more about the agenda and our results, I encourage you to visit our website at stopmedicarefraud.gov. So today our department, and the, our department and the Justice Department are releasing a report to Congress that shows just how impressive these results have been. And to talk a little more about that report and our interdepartmental fraud fighting efforts, I'd like to introduce a great defender of the American people, a great partner in fighting health care fraud, Attorney General Eric Holder. General. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I'm uh, pleased to join Secretary Sibelius in providing an update on our joint efforts to combat health care fraud and specifically to protect taxpayer dollars on our Medicare and Medicaid programs. Now, the Departments of Justice and HHS have a long history of working together in the fight against health care fraud. Now, today, we are submitting the Health Care Fraud and Abuse Control Program Annual Report, which outlines the last fiscal year's prevention and enforcement achievements. Uh, this report shows the success of our collaborative efforts to prevent, to identify, and to prosecute the most egregious instances of health care fraud. Over the years, we have seen that as long as health care fraud pays and goes unpunished, our health care system will remain under siege. These crimes harm all of us, government agencies and programs, insurers and health care providers, and individual patients. But we're fighting back. As our latest kickback report shows, we have made meaningful, measurable progress. In fact, last year brought record levels of achievement. In the last fiscal year, as a result of our joint efforts, approximately $2.5 billion was deposited to the Medicare Trust Fund an increase of more than half a billion dollars over the prior year's total. We also won or negotiated more than $1.6 billion in judgments and settlements. The Justice Department's criminal division and our U.S. Attorney's offices opened more than 1,000 new criminal health care fraud investigations and had more than 1,600 health care fraud criminal investigations pending. We reached an all-time high in the number of health care fraud defendants charged with more than 800 indictments in nearly 500 cases and close to 600 convictions. And the Justice Department's Civil Division opened nearly 900 new civil health care fraud investigations and had more than 1,100 pending cases. Now, these numbers, though, tell only a part of the story. Last year also brought a critical step forward in our health care fraud fight the creation that Kathleen described of our health care fraud prevention and enforcement action team, better known as HEAT. Uh, in establishing this task force last May, our two agencies were inspired by common cause and by common sense. We realized that to overcome a problem as complex and widespread as health care fraud, it was time to redouble our efforts. HEAT has elevated our joint fight against both civil and criminal health care fraud as a cabinet level priority. We're bringing to bear the full resources of the federal government against individuals and corporations who illegally divert taxpayer resources for their own gain. And our approach is working. So far, HEAT has enhanced our ability to bring abuse to light and criminals to justice. And it's enabled the recovery of stolen funds and the return of millions of dollars to the US Treasury and the Medicare Trust Fund. Now, much of this success can be attributed to our Medicare fraud strike forces, which are at the core of HEAT's law enforcement mission. On the criminal side, through the HEAT initiative, our agencies have 
expanded Medicare fraud strike forces to seven regions across the country, from South Florida to Detroit to Houston, where Medicare data showed hotspots of unexplained billing levels. To date, strike force prosecutors from U.S. Attorney's offices and the Justice Department's criminal division have sought approximately $500 million in court-ordered restitution to the Medicare program in nearly 300 health care fraud cases involving more than 560 defendants. More than 300 guilty pleas have been secured, and 250 defendants have been sentenced to prison, with sentences ranging from two months to 30 years. And also on the civil enforcement front, our health care fraud recoveries last year under the False Claims Act exceeded a stunning $2.2 billion. Now, I'm proud of the great work performed by the Justice Department's prosecutors, agents, analysts, and investigators, and also by our partners here at HHS. These accomplishments reflect this administration's ongoing and intensive efforts to protect the American people and to safeguard precious taxpayer dollars. Our commitment to fiscal accountability, combating fraud, and returning resources back to the U.S. Treasury, state treasuries, and the Medicare Trust Fund is just one of the many ways that we're working to help the American people at a time when budgets are tight. In fact, for every dollar that we spend combating health care fraud, we're able to return four dollars to the U.S. Treasury and the American taxpayers. Now, despite our successes, we cannot rest. Instead, we must take our work to the next level. We plan to expand our anti-fraud strategies and techniques through the new Affordable Care Act. This law provides new resources and includes tough new rules and penalties. Working with our federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement partners, we will use the expanded capabilities that the Affordable Care Act provides to stop health care fraud in its tracks. And we will work vigorously with all of our law enforcement partners to ensure that fraudsters cannot use this historic legislation to perpetrate health care fraud on our senior citizens and other vulnerable Americans. We will punish these criminals to the fullest extent of the law, and we will bring to justice those who seek to take billions of dollars from the pockets of taxpayers. We're also engaging the private sector in this fight, and we will continue to work with industry leaders to share information about emerging fraud schemes and to institute effective compliance and anti-fraud programs. So on that forward-looking note, I would now like to turn things over to one of our dedicated partners, the Inspector General of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, Dan Levinson. Dan? Mr. Attorney General, Madam Secretary, thank you. As the Attorney General has noted, the most recent report of the anti-fraud account, DOJ HHS effort, reveals very solid and encouraging results in the fight against health care fraud. And on behalf of our office, I would like to thank you, Attorney General, and all of your great team at uh, the Criminal Division, at the Civil Division, at the FBI, and at U.S. Attorney offices nationwide for being such strong and effective partners and bringing so many of our cases to a successful close. I would like for a moment to speak to the program integrity provisions of the new act. Uh, program integrity is foremost in the minds of everyone in our office as implementation of the new law commences. The breadth and scope of health care reform alters the oversight landscape in many important respects, and our office anticipates assuming a wide range of expanded new responsibilities. To help us meet these responsibilities, the Affordable Care Act provides expanded law enforcement authorities, as the Attorney General summarized, greater coordination among federal agencies, and enhanced funding for the health care fraud and abuse control program. Examples include expanded access to and uses of data, as well as new exclusion and civil monetary penalty authorities. The Affordable Care Act also strengthens provider enrollment standards, as the Secretary noted, promotes compliance with program requirements, enhances program oversight, and strengthens the government's response to health care fraud and abuse 
and the ability to hold perpetrators accountable. Our staff will bring their expertise to bear throughout implementation and as mandated in the Affordable Care Act will play a critical role in advising the Secretary on implementation efforts. I'd like to underscore the importance of the healthcare compliance outreach programs because they are so vital both to the successful implementation of the new law and to our work in the Inspector General's office. Prevention efforts such as compliance programs are integral to curbing healthcare fraud, waste, and abuse. Under the Affordable Care Act, providers and suppliers will be required to adopt compliance programs that meet a core set of requirements to be developed by the Secretary in consultation with our office. We are pleased and we are grateful that the Secretary has made available resources for us to conduct compliance training programs over the coming year for health care providers and compliance professionals. The training will focus on methods to identify fraud risk areas and compliance best practices so providers can strengthen their own compliance efforts and more effectively identify and avoid illegal schemes that may be targeting their communities. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, before we take questions, I want to introduce a few other members of our anti-fraud team who are with us on stage today. Marilyn Tavner is our new Principal Deputy Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. As the highest ranking official in that agency, she's made sure that we stay aggressive about rooting out waste and fraud and preventing it from happening in the first place. Dr. Peter Budetti is also with us today. Peter heads up our new Office of Program Integrity in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. As the health insurance debate unfolded, President Obama and I decided that we needed an office specifically dedicated to eliminating waste and fraud in Medicare and Medicaid. And we're pleased that we could get someone with Peter's expertise to come and lead that office. We also plan to create additional program integrity initiatives across HHS to root out waste and fraud in other department agencies from FDA to NIH to the Administration on Children and Families. To help these agencies share best practices, we've created a new department-wide Council on Program Integrity that will help keep a close eye on everything our department does to ensure we're being responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. Finally, on stage with me today is Kathy Greenlee, our terrific Assistant Secretary for Aging. Now, you've heard a lot about the steps we're taking in government to eliminate fraud, and we take this responsibility very seriously, as I know does the Attorney General. And you've heard today we're going to continue to look for new ways to protect taxpayer dollars and go after the criminals who steal them. But the best protection against fraud is educated consumers, and that's why over the next few months we'll be working with Kathy and seniors groups across the country to educate America's seniors about the benefits in the new law and also how to recognize scam artists who are trying to exploit them. In the last few weeks alone, we've heard stories about people going door to door, trying to sell fake so-called Obamacare policies. In other states, seniors were sold policies that protect them from death panels. One company in Nevada was offering full health insurance for $29.95 and that included dental coverage. Not a bad deal, unfortunately, too good to be true. We want to help seniors recognize, resist, and report these scams. And a good model for that very successful program that Kathy's agency already runs is called Senior Medicare Patrol. Through the patrol and its army of troops, seniors are trained to talk to their friends and neighbors to explain how to prevent and recognize fraud. Since 1997, they've reached over 20 million Americans. To us, that's like having 20 million undercover police officers on our side. And if you're a criminal, that's a lot more dangerous to call a senior up and ask for a Medicare ID number. If there's a chance, they might recognize you, recognize what you're doing, and turn around and report you. 
So in the next few months, our goal is to get even more seniors involved and to send a clear message to the crooks that fraud doesn't pay. For years, we've tolerated healthcare fraud. We've accepted that with any big enterprise, there was going to be some waste and abuse. But those days are coming to an end. As we try to bring down skyrocketing costs across our healthcare system, we can't afford to ignore the billions of dollars we, use to fr we lose to fraud and theft. At a time when families are struggling to make every dollar count, we must too. We've got some evidence today that our strategy is already working, as the attorney told you in his report. And that's very encouraging, but we're not satisfied. The Affordable Care Act gives us new tools and resources we need to turn up the heat even higher on crooks across the country. And we're going to put those tools to work. Thank you, and we'd be happy now to answer your questions if you have some questions. Yes, sir. I'm curious to hear if there are uh, plans or provisions to share claims data with um, private payers to sort of try to get that side also. There's a lot of waste in, in, on that side of the system, so I'd be interested to hear your take. Well, at this point, we're putting together a data system initially to share with um, our partners at Justice, real-time data. Uh, that can be monitored and um, gone after in real time and instead of this sort of um, pay and chase theory to try and monitor the billing aberrations and with the expanded strike force capacity um, try to knock it down right away. I know there was some discussion uh, at the healthcare fraud summit about expanding that radius. Uh, I don't know what the timetable is right now. There are some strategies, frankly, uh, being implemented in the private sector that we're trying to model in the public sector. Uh, if you think about the way credit card companies have the capability of finding an aberrant billing pattern and immediately notifying someone or shutting down that opportunity to continue to abuse what may be a stolen credit card, that's the kind of system that's very um, flexible, very nimble, and very quick that we are actually trying to catch up with. So I think that there are lots of plans to try and uh, continue to involve the, the private sector in certainly sharing practices, sharing strategies. I, I can't tell you exactly what the timetable is for data sharing, and it gets a little complicated given the, the confidentiality issues that involve our data system. But we're thrilled at least we're going to have a system finally uh, over the next couple of years that puts, first of all, all of our data in one spot. Right now we can't even look at our own data simultaneously. It's in several different systems and also share it with law enforcement partners. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you that you're here right now, but earlier today you announced that there were several arrests made uh, in the uh, Times Square bombing. It's now a few hours later and more information is coming in. Is there anything more you can tell us about those arrests? Is there anything definitely connecting these men to uh, the, the bomber or the attempted bombing? And uh, what can you tell us that you know now a few hours later? Well, at least three arrests have been made uh, at this point um, in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, these are people who are connected to um, Mr. Shazad. Uh, we're still trying to determine exactly what the nature of that connection was. Um, there is at least uh, a basis to believe that one of the things that they did was to provide him with, uh, with funds. And so we are trying to trace back to see what exactly uh, was the nature of th th those transactions? Uh, what was the purpose of the uh, of the sharing of that uh, of those monies? And so the this is just part of an ongoing investigation. And uh, I think it though is a significant step. Is there any more reason to believe that there was prior knowledge that any of these people have no knowledge that this money was going to go to uh, for a bomb attempt? Well, that's one of the things we're going to be trying to determine. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, Mr. Attorney General. <clears throat> I had a question about uh, the the types of fraud that are going on. Um, we see um, 
Justice Department press releases uh, weekly about HIV infusion clinics, uh, DME fraud, home health fraud. Wondering, uh, you mentioned some of the, the false uh, Obamacare, quote unquote, uh, policies. What, what other types of, of fraud are you uncovering? And, um, and secondly, the, the law allows uh, the agency to withhold payment to Medicare and Medicaid providers if, in, uh, if there are credible allegations of fraud pending. And I wondered if you could help us uh, define what that means. Thank you. Well, I've, some of the, um, I would say there's uh, likely to be uh, layers of fraudulent activity. Uh, some of what we described today are new uh, sort of person to person um, scams occurring, trying to take advantage, as you know, in the uh, benefit that will help seniors pay um, for prescription drugs. They are eligible for a $250 check. That benefit has begun to be talked about, and checks will begin being mailed uh, starting in June for seniors who have reached the, the so-called donut hole. Um, there are people who have decided that that's a great opportunity to show up at a senior's door, ask for Medicare numbers, a signature on a form, suggesting that they will then help the senior access that benefit. Um, the way the law is written, seniors don't have to do anything to access the benefit. We can monitor the billing data. The checks will be sent automatically. They should never give an ID number or sign anything. Uh, so we're, we are anticipating uh, those kinds of scams, individuals who figure out that they're going to take advantage of a situation and try to take advantage of a vulnerable population, selling a policy that isn't real, arguably trying to steal information under false pretenses. And then there's a whole level of, I think, ongoing, um, much more sophisticated uh, fraudulent activity perpetrated at various parts of the Medicare system, uh, which moves a little over a billion dollars a day uh, if you put it in perspective to various providers across the country. So part of what was outlined, and I think the um, Inspector General amplified, are steps uh, to try and actually um, prevent, and then in a much more timely fashion, if it hasn't been prevented, find those. So much tighter screening for providers to actually become enrolled in the first place and verification uh, that wasn't in place before so people can't just uh, become providers and start billing under false pretenses. More opportunity to do face-to-face -face checks of who is actually uh, setting up shop. Uh, more opportunity to look at data systems and find aberrant billing patterns, uh, you know, tracking things much more quickly. And as the general said, we now have seven of these strike forces in areas that have been kind of hot spots, but the plan is and the resources have been provided to expand that footprint uh, for additional strike forces around the country. Uh, and I think it's likely not only uh, reaching out to um, the U.S. attorneys, but attorneys general and getting them engaged and involved in both of these efforts. And in terms of the final piece of your question about the withholding until we determine um, the uh, actual verification of a billing practice. We are currently developing. Uh, we'll be working with the Inspector General's office, with our General Counsel's office, soliciting information about what that framework looks like. And there's a real, there's a real tension uh, between getting providers paid in a timely fashion so that we don't ask doctors and hospitals and uh, medical providers to um, delay their ability to be reimbursed for services delivered and making sure that we are trying to uh, not engage in this sort of pay and chase methodology. So developing a system where on one hand we're, we're doing everything to prevent fraud, but on the other hand we're paying legitimate providers on a timely basis is I think um, the framework that we're going to be developing over the next couple of months. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.